just need to get where I'm going. Cool. What, what time did you... 7.15. Oh, that's plenty of time. So, just going to talk this evening about multiplication. And it is so cool just to be in a place like this where we are already multiplying out, multiplying a gospel community, multiplying a faith community. It's, uh, it's absolutely incredible. I think it is in the heart of God. And we're going to see about that in just a minute. Um, so go with me in your Bibles if you have them to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. So Father, we love you as we go to your word. Would you lead us and guide us? Would you touch us and change us? Would you challenge us, Lord, and lead us on into more of what you have for us? In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, here we go. Genesis 1, verse 1. You all right? Still paging? Shouldn't be that hard to find Genesis 1. I'm just, just saying, just putting that out there for you. I'm just... Listen, Joe's jo a very brave man. He has me back often, and in some churches I'm on a 10-year rotation because of stuff like that. But anyway, here we go. Okay, Genesis 1. And then God said, let the land produce vegetation. Is this too loud? Is that okay? Yeah, good. God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds, and it was so. The land produced vegetation. Plants bearing seed according to their kind, and trees bearing fruit with a seed in it, according to their kind. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning of the third day. Uh, verse 28, we're going to just skip down a, a little bit there. Verse 28, 27, so God created them, mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. Verse 29, God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And so we have just see this thing of like right at the beginning of creation, there's this multiplication principle built into what God is doing. This thing of seed is built in. And we use this illustration often for us in Denver, where I lead a church, we use this illustration, if you cut open an apple, you can count the seeds in the apple very, very easily, whatever it is, 10, 12, 20 seeds, you can count the seeds in the apple, but what you cannot count is the potential apples in each one of those seeds. Does that make sense? Because a single one of those seeds could grow to be an apple tree that can over its life produce thousands of apples. And each one of those seeds could become a tree that could produce thousands of apples. It's limitless. The potential in seed is limitless. Are you, are you doing okay? And so it's a principle. It's something written right into the, into the DNA of God's creation right in the beginning of time. He says it to man as well. Go forth and be fruitful. Multiply and fill the earth. Every seed, every seed has everything in it to become a tree after its own kind. Then we go to Genesis 8, verse 22. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. So I just want us just to prophetically just read this text again and just read it like this. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest will never cease. You see that? As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest will never cease. And I want to tell you sometimes, friends, we've got to have faith for the harvest. I think sometimes it's easy for us to have faith to put seed in the ground. And we keep saying, we sow in seed, we sow in seed, we sow in seed. I want to tell you, friends, every now and then we've got to hit the pause button and say, okay, God, we've got seed in the ground. Now your word says we can trust you for harvest. A harvest of souls, a harvest of faith communities, whatever it is that we trust in God for. When we've put seed in the ground, this Bible says we can trust him for harvest. And then we get to the call, the gospel to all nations. Genesis 12 says this, all nations will be blessed through you. Talking about Jesus, this seed, this seed, singular, this seed. 
Jesus Christ. The blessing to all nations is Jesus. The blessing to all nations is to take the gospel to nations that have not yet heard the name of Jesus Christ. Sandy and I have had the privilege of doing that in many different places. One of our trips was to Hong Kong. And just fascinating to, to encounter people that do not have a concept of who Jesus is. Not a single concept. And we would go out with interpreters and we would say, and we said to this one guy, do you know about Jesus? And he said, no, but this old guy in the corner there, he's lived here a long time. If Jesus is around you, he'll know where to find him. Like, don't have a concept of what we're talking about. Don't have a concept of what we're talking about. Some friends of ours went back on a later trip and they said, uh, you know, Hong Kong is one of the biggest shopping cities in the world. And these guys are trying to draw Western shoppers in. And so they said they saw this display in a storefront with Santa Claus on the cross. And they're mixing up these two things of Jesus on the cross and Santa Claus is when we buy stuff for people. Not a clue, not a concept. We've got to trust God for harvest in places like this. I've had the privilege to travel through Africa. I've had the privilege to travel through Mexico. This word is true, Matthew 28. Go into all the world. 45 years ago, New Covenant Ministries International, we took seriously this word of the gospel to all nations. At one stage, we were based just in South Africa. We, we, yet, we were yet to have an international church, yet to have an international church plant. And a couple of us got together. We were at a conference, and a couple of us got together. I want to say six of us, maybe eight of us with our wives, and we were, and we were in a hotel room, and we were just dreaming. Man, I've got a heart for this nation. I've got a heart for this nation. I've got a heart for Mexico. Uh, one of my buddies did have a heart for Hong Kong. That's why we went to help him plant the church. We've got a heart for Mexico. And we used to travel to Mexico from South Africa. Um, you know, all of these things. And then, we, and then we said this. And this was probably maybe 30 years ago. And we said this. You know what? One day we're going to have a reunion. And we're going to have to do it somewhere really central. Like Hawaii. And we screamed it. We thought it was the funniest thing. We were slapping our... We are in over 100 nations around the world. I'm talking about churches, boots on the ground. Over 100 nations around the world. Because we trusted God for this word of multiplication. Seed time and harvest. Take the seed of Jesus. Take the gospel of Jesus to every nation. You're doing okay? And it's going to get done, right? It's going to get done. We can read the end of the book. Every nation, every tongue, and every tribe standing before the throne. It's going to get done. The only question is with us or without us. I don't want to be sitting on the sideline. They give me a hard time back home because I'm about to be 60. They're like, TK, you're so old now. And I'm like, bro, I am just getting warmed up. And I'm coming into my prime. I've been at this for 30 plus years. I'm more excited about the things of God and more excited about some of this stuff than I ever have been in my life. Sometimes we're laying in bed and Sandy, I'm going to tell Sandals, you know, she, babe, please, just, can we just sleep now? And I'm like, okay, baby, I just have to tell you five more things. So, man, we, there's something in this word that gets inside us that if we trust God for what is in this word, seed time and harvest will never pass away. The Lord spoke to us a number of years ago in Denver, this little phrase, 10 in 10. 10 in 10. And we had to pray on it as elders and just be like, what are you saying, Lord? What is 10 in 10? That's weird. It's not a scripture. We tried looking at books, John 10, 10, you know, all of that stuff. And nothing was clear to us. And we prayed on it for a little while. And eventually we felt, God, this was what God required of us. Some combination of 10 church plants or 10 multi-sites in the next 10 years. And we've just planted our fourth church. We've planted two in Australia, one in California, and now one about an hour south of us. In, uh, in the south of Denver. I'm telling you, man, this is exciting when it gets in you. When it gets in you. You, you might be here this, this evening and you're just going, well, I just showed up here for a happy time. And that's cool. That's how it starts. That's how the Lord gets you. He's going to be like, okay, you're in the army now. Now you're recruited. Now we're on this journey. Now we're going. You know what we're going to need to do that? we're going to have to see multiplication of salvations. 
multiplication of salvations, multiplication of disciples, multiplication of leaders, multiplication of connect groups, or you call them discipleship groups, multiplications of, of musicians and worship leaders, multiplication of elders and pastors, and then multiplication of church plants and multi-sites. The cool thing is that Jesus doesn't expect us to go it alone. In that Matthew 28 text, when he talks about taking the gospel to all nations, he says this, and surely I'm with you always, always, to the very end of the age. Acts 1, which is well, the Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the outer part, part most of the earth, starts with this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. Timothy and Bibles, real quick, to Mark chapter 6. Okay with that? Mark. Mark. When I'm in Australia, it's Mark. I'm reading from verse 30. The apostles, some translations say the, uh, the disciples, the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For men who were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in a boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them. And they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went to shore, he saw a great crowd. And he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when, he grew, when it grew late... His disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy something to eat. Can you imagine how the disciples regretted those words later when they actually got Jesus' mission? Because now there's a crowd and Jesus is teaching them and their word is like, send them away. Don't you think they regretted that when they got the mission in the end of what Jesus was trying to do? But he answered them, you give them something to eat. And there's a pattern switch here. There's a parallel miracle. The Old Testament miracle like this is manna and quail, where God fed the Israelites as he led them out of Egypt. And he fed them manna and quail. And the manna and quail is God to us. Yeah? Israelites had nothing to do with that. God rained down manna and quail on them. God to us. And now we see a different pattern here. We see a pattern change. Because now when there's 5,000 men that need to be fed, they didn't count women and children, so probably close to 12 to 15,000 people at a very minimum. 12 to 15,000 people that need to be fed, and it's no longer God to us. Jesus says to his disciples, you give them something to eat. And so now it's not God to us, it's God through us. There's a pattern change there. Something changes between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Old Testament, God to us. New Testament, you give them something to eat. What God is going to do on planet Earth, what God is going to do here in Apex, what God is going to do in Cary, what God is going to do for us in Denver, Colorado, is going to happen through us. Not even one of you excited about that? <laughs> I was preaching myself happy this evening. But it's God through us. What a privilege that we get to play a role in a mission as important as the salvation of man on planet Earth. God gets to include us. We just have to say, yes, sir. Include me in your plan. Thank you, baby. You give them something to eat. He said, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them? And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said five and two fish. Now, this miracle is talked about, I think, in all four Gospels. And some, some of the Gospels will say this. It was a little boy's lunch. It was a little boy's lunch. Now, we can take something from that, right? What do we take from that? Not even a grown man's lunch. This is not enough to feed one person. And there's twelve to 15,000 there at a minimum. This is not even a one-man lunch. This is a little boy's lunch. But they put it in the hands of Jesus. And it says, Jesus looked up 
commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. They sat down in groups by hundreds and fifties. There is an administration necessary. There's banks in place. There's eldership. There's government. There's the word of God. There's ways for God to do things that allows his power and his miraculous power to flow. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven. Isn't that beautiful? Like right there in that moment, he acknowledges his father. Okay, I've got a little boy's lunch, and I've got twelve to 15,000 people to feed you. The first thing I'm going to do is look up and thank my father for this little boy's lunch. And you see, there's something about gratitude. Gratitude precedes generosity. There's something about gratitude that allows things to be multiplied, and then we can be generous and share. Are you doing okay? If we're not grateful for what we've got, we'll never be able to open our hands and let anybody else have any of it. Let me close our hands. The problem when you close your hands, you can't share, but neither can God put anything else in. You're doing okay? Then you've got what you've got. But we can open our hands, look up to heaven. Thank you, Lord, for what I've got. Thank you for this paycheck. Not what I wanted, but it's what I've got. But thank you for it. You see, we'll see God do some amazing things, friends. Looks up to heaven. Gives thanks. Uh, said a blessing, prayed over it, broke the loaves, gave them to disciples to set before the people. He divided the two fish among them all. Verse 42, underline that in your Bible. They all ate and were satisfied. And there's something in that. They all ate and were satisfied. I, I want to tell you, man, as we've been saying here, everybody's got a role to play. Everybody's got a role to play. If we all will take our little thing and put it in the hands of God, God will multiply it, and we get a role to play. I've got many stories like this, but the, the one that illustrates it the best is an old story out of our church that we led in South Africa. We planted in South Africa. Apartheid came down in, in, in April, and we planted in the July of 1994. And we had a very multicultural church right off the bat. It was what God asked of us, right coming out of apartheid, the word that God gave us in planting that church was that we were to be a multicultural church. And that church still in South Africa now is still one of the most multicultural church in all of our partnership. And uh, this, uh, this guy, and, and we, we know the story afterwards, right? This guy came in and he was going to commit suicide. And he looked in the newspaper. We were the only church at that time in that little city that had an evening service. And so he's coming into the evening service, and he had said this to God. I'm going to go to church. He wasn't a believer. I'm going to go to church and see if you've got something for me. If you don't have anything for me, I'm going to go home and kill myself. And so the worship team is up. I'm on the front row, facing that way. This guy comes in, stays for two or three songs, and he goes, nope, nothing here for me. And he leaves. And a guy. Not an elder, not a pastor, not a deacon, not a worship leader, not a discipleship group leader, no, not just a guy, a guy in the life of the church saw him walk out and followed him out into the parking lot and said to him, you okay, bro? And he said, nah, going home to kill myself. And the guy that followed him out said, can we talk about that? And he said, sure. And they started to talk. And this guy led him to the Lord, brought him back into the meeting Right, uh, the, the whole meeting was over when he brought him back in and introduced him to me. See, we got, we've got to understand the difference between visible and important. See, because people are visible on a Sunday morning. People are visible here on a Sunday night. But you know what was important in this story? The little boy's lunch. Does that make sense? The little boy's lunch. And let me tell you something. You can come in here with a little boy's lunch. You can come in here with just a little thing. But if you will allow it to be put in the hands of Jesus, then every single one of us starts to play a vital role in the life of the church. Every single one of us starts to play a vital role as we trust in God for multiplication here in, in Apex. Are you doing okay? It's another story like that. As I land. Genesis 3. God has heard the cry of Israel in Egypt, 430 years. They've been in bondage, in slavery, 430 years. And he hears their cry. 
and he calls a man to lead them out. He calls Moses. And Moses makes all of these excuses, and I wish I had time to work them through. We, we, we're doing a series in Exodus right now at home. We did a whole Sunday morning just on the excuses, just dismantling the excuses that Moses made, because they're the same excuses we make today. Oh, I'm trying so hard not to preach that. <laughs> but at the end of all these excuses, God says to Moses, what's that in your hand? And he says a staff, right? Modern day translation, we don't have staffs, we have sticks. What's it in your hand? It's a stick. Like how, what value is a stick? What's it in your hand? It's a stick, Lord. And he says, throw it down. And he lays it down and it becomes a snake. And God says to him, pick it up by the tail. Now, I just want to tell you, I, I'm, y'all have snakes here, yeah? Snakes in north, you yeah? know? We do in we do in Colorado. We got rattlesnakes. I just want to tell you what God is telling Moses is not the right thing to do. I grew up in Africa. If you want to pick a snake up, the last place you pick a snake up is by the tail. Okay, and I'm gonna one one day you're gonna have a snake by the tail. You're gonna remember this. It's gonna save your life, and you're gonna send me a text say thanks, TK. <laughs> if you do pick a snake up by the tail, there's a way to do it. You pick the snake up by the tail, and you have to keep your hand moving. If you keep your hand still, the snake can come around about you. But if you keep your hand moving, the snake will just flop around like this. Right? Just remember that. When you've got the snake by the just shake your hand. That was for free, no extra charge. <laughs> so, so, he throws the sna- so he throws the stick down, becomes a snake, picks it up, turns back into a staff. Now that's the staff. That's the stick that split the Red Sea. So once again, what's in my hand? Just like this little useless thing, this stick. Throw it down, lay it down. Allow God to resurrect it and allow God to put something in your hand that is an instrument of his power and his glory. It's so simple. It's not hard. None of these principles are hard. They're actually simple principles to get. If we put the little boy's lunch in his hand, what is that? It's a little boy's lunch. Put it in his hand, watch him multiply it. What's this in my hand? Just a stick, Lord. Lay it down. Allow him to resurrect it for his power and his glory. Then we see multiplication. Then we see the presence of God. Then we see the power of God. When I got saved, and I shared a little bit of my testimony over the weekend. When I got saved, I was in a little fishing village on the north coast of Zululand. Zululand's different to Disneyland, right? Okay. <laughs> It's where the Shaka Zulu came from. It's, so anyway, so in, in, the, in the, the north coast of, of Zululand, just this little fishing village, maybe 600 people in the, in, the, in the whole town. And I got chicken pox. I was 25 years old and I got chicken pox. And you know when you get those, those childhood diseases as an adult, you can get real sick. And I was real sick. I, I was real sick. And s- somebody, there was a... And, it was, I don't have time. It was a weird little church. I mean, listen, weird things happen in small towns, yeah? <laughs> yeah, so it was a weird little church. They loved the Lord, but just they were weird. So they found out that I was sick, and they brought me three cooked meals a day for 10 days. Three cooked meals a day for 10 days. Woke up on Saturday morning just roaring. I thought I was dying. Opened the window. There's all these guys mowing my lawn. Some of those guys owned their own businesses, but they were out there mowing a 25-year-old kid's lawn that had never yet visited their church one time. And there's a, there was a flow to this thing. A couple of months later, and I was a good heathen. I was a happy heathen. I wasn't looking for the Lord. A couple of months later, I felt God blessed me. God blessed me. And I had this idea, I'm going to go to church one time. I'm going to show up at church one time. God's going to be happy I showed up. That's be, that'll be cool. I feel like I've done my duty. He can go about his business. I'll go back about my business. Didn't work out like that because I'm still here. But the point is this. When I wanted to go to church, I knew which church to go to. Because they had already showed me that they loved me and cared for me. How did they do it? Cooked me a meal. How did they do it? Pushed a lawnmower around my yard. 
See, when we'll do the simple things, when we'll just allow that thing, what's that in your hand? It's a lawnmower. What's that in your, what, what ability have you got? I, well, I can't get up there and preach. Can you bake a plate of cookies? Can you bake a meal and take it to a sick neighbor? Can you make a meal? What, what's in your hand? It's just this little thing. But when it's in the hand of God, he can do amazing things with it. He can do absolutely amazing things with it. Are you doing okay? They'd bring me a pile of books. I said, what books do you like to read? And I said, Louis L'Amour. I like cowboy books. Louis L'Amour. So they'd bring, these, they'd bring like three or four of these Louis L'Amour books. And underneath it, the cross and the switchblade. And then they'd say, they'd come back a few days later. Have you read those books? I'm like, mm-hmm. All those books? Mm-hmm. They'd bring me some more books. Another little Christian book at the bottom of the pile. It's not, it's not complicated, friends. It's not complicated. If we will take what we have... What's that in your hand? Just my checkbook, Lord, and there's not a lot of money in my bank account. It's all right. It's put in the hands of God. Watch God multiply. Watch God use it for something. Uh, Joe, Joe did something at the partner's night that I could never reproduce, but I, I just loved it when he talked about the budget for this place. And imagine what would happen in the budget for this place if one person gets saved. And then they go on to marry somebody and they, and they save together, and they raise Christian kids. And one of those kids becomes the worship. Do you know, it's like, for what? For a couple of thousand dollars a month? What are we talking about? It's a little thing. It's a little thing. But we'll put it in the hands of God. God can do amazing things with it. God multiplies, not us. I can't multiply Jack. God multiplies. Put it in the hands of God. What's that in your hand? A stick. Lay it down. What's that in your hand? Put it in the Lord's hand. Every single one of us in here to play a role in getting the gospel to the nations. Sometimes we get more excited about that. We get way more excited about preaching the gospel to the nation than sharing with our neighbors. But I want to tell you, friends, we need backyard missionaries. We need front porch missionaries. We need grill out missionaries. We need coffee table missionaries and dinner table missionaries. Let's get that done. Let's get that done. I can cook a meal. I'm not super domesticated, but I do like to cook. So, But we cook. We have people in our home. You know, every time we move out of a house, Sandals and I, every time we move out, we've got this little thing that we do. We wait until all the furniture's out, truck's packed, and we go back in and we stand in the living room just for a moment. We stand in the living room and we go, man, remember that couple we led to the Lord? Remember that couple that couldn't have kids? And we sat around this dining room table and we wept, we sobbed and we prayed. And now they've got two little girls. Remember that couple that sat and they said they were getting divorced and we asked them, please, just give God a chance. And they said, okay. And we met with them week after week after week. They had two kids when we had that conversation. Now they've got four kids, happily married. That's a real story. That couple's in the ministry today. You know what I'm saying? For what? for opening my home, for cooking a meal, for daring to say, can we give God a chance? Such a little thing. When we put in the hand of God, God can do absolutely amazing things with it. Let's stand together.